Welcome to the uh, second reading by your wife of Palestinian origin in this year's festival. Mazen Maru has at least at least two nationalities, Palestinian and Icelandic, but was born in Beirut, so I don't know whether that qualifies him for Lebanese citizenship or not. We can we can talk about that. He's a translator of journalist, but he was once a chemistry physics teacher as well. And uh, he's written for a lot of Arabic magazines and newspapers based in Beirut, in London, and on the West Bank, and in Paris. As you can, as you can see, many of these Arabic uh, publications are um, part of the diaspora. In English, we have his first short story collection, Jokes for the Gunmen which won a major uh, prize in the Pan-Arab world, a uh, uh, big prize of $20,000. And it was uh, an amazing achievement for short story collection on the very short, long list of the Man Booker International Prize. There's only 13 uh, titles ever included on that, that, that long list. And as we know, uh, Novels has such an advantage over short stories when it comes to receiving such prizes. It really was an achievement in itself to have a short story collection on that on, on that list. Um, Mazin has published three collections of poetry. Our grief resembles bread. The camera doesn't capture birds, and an angel suspended on a clothesline. And he's already published in Arabic a second short story collection. And we're going to get kind of get we're kind of going to get an extra bang for a buck tonight because the two stories that Mazin is going to read this evening are actually from the second collection, which isn't yet published. So uh, you know you can get extra value by buying this book for the stories you haven't heard tonight. And the two stories from his second collection. And intriguingly, granted, are about to publish uh, a new short story, which will be in this third collection. Uh, they're going to be publishing that before Christmas. And he's working on a novel as well at the moment. So how we're going to do this is we're going to begin by talking a little bit about the life. And Mazin will read a story. And we'll talk a little bit about the work. And that's the end by reading another story. And of course, it's going to be impossible to talk about the life without making some reference to the work, or talking about the work without making some reference to the life. But we're generally going to try and concentrate on the life to begin with, and the work afterwards. So, Mazin, you were born in Beirut in 1982. Uh, Sorry, 1978. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out later why 1982 is stuck in my head. Um, because shortly after that, uh, your family moved to the Shatila refugee camp. And how long were you there for? Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much to, uh, for being here. And I know it's a little bit weird to start talking about. Sabra and Shatila massacre, you know, the first question. Uh, but yes, my parents were actually, they fled another massacre in 1975. They were newly married and they had to leave. Uh, the whole camp was demolished yeah. uh, to a Zafar camp in 1975. They moved outside the camp and then they moved to Shatila camp. And in 1981, one year before the massacre, they moved out of the camp. My father was fed up fighting with people all the time, all these neighbors, and he decided that, okay, it's better, I just get out. And, yeah. and the 1975 uh, massacre, that camp, was that also based in Lebanon? Yeah, it was in Lebanon, and uh, the whole camp was demolished, like, uh, lots of people maybe. You know, there's no clear numbers when it comes to casualties, and that... Uh, so it's estimated between 2,000 and 3,000 people mm -hmm. were slaughtered. And um, my parents were among the people who could flee. And there's a beautiful, really, story about how they fled. And 
I've always thought of in thinking about like ranking it as a novel, but I think it's too personal. Mm -hmm. And there were other, I mean, there were other massacres after the Chatier refugee camp in the mid 80s, and the list of protagonists is mind boggling. Um, the, the camps were mainly under the control of the PLO, and in, in the mid 80s, wars against the camps, you had the Communist Party, you had the Christian Phalangists, you had the Shia militia. You had um, various Palestinian dissident groups who were opposed to the PLO, all allied and attacking the PLO. I mean, it, it's mind boggling. Um, I was nine years of age when the Yom Kippur War happened. And, you know, the, it was the time of the Cold War, and um, the Arabs and the Israelis were proxies of the Soviet Union and the United States. I, in fact, only learned recently that there were 4,000 Cubans fought with the Egyptians during the Yom Kippur War. Um, and we were swamped, because we, we were in the Western sphere of influence, we were swamped with a lot of uh, news stories that were very sympathetic to Israel at the time. And there were many of us who were sympathetic to Israel because of the Kibbutzim movement uh, in Israel, we saw the court scene as, as sort of some sort of um, utopian socialist arrangement, and we were impressed, I guess, that Golda Meir's party was a Labour party. And many of us uh, never stopped being friends of Israel. But it took us a long process, but the beginning for me was the Shatil massacre, you know, where the Christian philanthropists went into the, the refugee camp. But the Israeli army was outside blocking the exit of, uh, of the people and then firing flares so the phalanges could find their targets. It was a terrible shock to many of us. And I know there are people in the audience now who would be totally sympathetic to the Palestinian cause who once were great friends of Israel. Um, so, how was it possible for your family to move out of refugee camp? I mean, did they. Did, did they uh, gain, uh, you know, was there an improvement in their in your father's standard of living that gave him the economic independence to move out? I mean, we talked about how he was almost pushed out by 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 by, by um, conflict within the camp anyway. Well, he was actually my father is a is a troublemaker, you know, <laughs> and, and, and that's why <clears throat> that's why I keep building him. He's, he's very good character for my stories, <laughs> and. Uh, Thanks to his troublemaking behavior, that he had a couple of fights with neighbors, like physical. And then I think he was beaten up, you know, and he decided that it's too much of an insult for him. So it was not at all related to any political circumstances. <laughs> he didn't give a shit about really politics or Palestine. He's a very controversial character, just lived for his own physical and emotional pleasures in life. And it took me a long, many years to understand his character, and I think I'm still trying to. He was he left uh, Palestine when he was six years old. Uh, I mean, he was enforced with like to to uh, he was forced to, to leave the country. So he's like a child of the Nakba, 1948. But he has no connection whatsoever to the political situation. You know, he just lived as an individualistic, and so like uh, of course it's. A, very complex history, what happened in Lebanon in the 80s and 70s. The thing is, like, the Cold War was, uh, had its influence everywhere, including Lebanon. So uh, it was like two uh, political campaigns, like the Egyptian Abdel Nasser campaign, and then you have the, which is like anti-American, and you have the pro-American that included Iraq and Afghanistan and Turkey at that time. It was like quite big, uh, much of a chaos, you know, and I don't know if we really have time to talk about, about all this. But I would say that, of course, um, as a Palestinian growing up in Lebanon and uh, hearing all these stories about the war and how the PLO, Yasser Arafat, and his factions, they were involved in the war, uh, I always, I was always careful to feel any 
blind uh, support to the PLO, though they are like supposed to represent me in a way. But the fascinating thing about a place like Lebanon is very small, lots of people live there of different sectors, of different orientations, religions, ideologies. And if you ask every group or people from every sector, you would get the story that you would say, oh, they are right, you know. So it's like, like it's, a, it's a place of narratives, a place of like where the political history has never uh, like treated, like sorted out, solved. That's, and in this way, these stories evolve and keep evolving. So it's like, it can be an inspiring place, you know, when you want to write uh, about like these fighters or how social they were or not, you know. Um, of course, I never spoke bluntly with my parents about the massacres that they had to flee because, but I tried a couple of times and they are really, um, usually they don't say much. And sometimes I, I am on the stage and they say, oh, I have traumas from the war and blah, blah. But I think my parents, what they witnessed was really, really something horrible, like, and this, of course, this is the story of many different people in Lebanon. Like, the controversy here is like, we speak about Sabra and Shatila, we speak about all these massacres, but we also, in the history of Lebanon, we have also stories of like these leftists and PLO committing massacres against the Christians there, you know? So it's like, and when it comes to me, I cannot differentiate between victim and victim, you know? Mm. For me, like when I see pictures and read about the massacres that were committed by the left, who were Marxists and, you know, like wanted to free Palestine, but they went to this village and they killed women and children, it doesn't give me any honor, you know? And this is what we lack as Palestinians. We don't have enough self-critique. We didn't go through this, you know? We have like symbols like Yasser Arafat, who's like a big hero, and we have, we live, within like these phantoms like that we're not supposed to to you know um, uh, criticize or or look after the history so it's it becomes quite problematic every time i mention this you know even when i talk about it with some palestinian guys from the camps i remember i it was really annoying for some people and i was threatened and i was like almost beaten up because i dared to speak about it you know but I think we, we there is some his part of history unsolved yet. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's very difficult for a writer to remain 100% faithful to an individual political movement or, or our party. You know? I mean, many of the European poets who were inspired by the ideals of communism were very, very disillusioned uh, by the invasion of Hungary and pogroms in, in Stalin's Soviet Union. Uh, it, a writer must first be a patriot of his own imaginative landscape. And, yeah. You know, like in Lebanon, we have fascinating stories of snipers who shoot, who shot at people and killed them, and they became writers and artists. So it's like a place with real sur surrealism. Like, it's very surreal, you know, when you meet an artist and you would tell, yeah, I was a sniper in the war, and, you know, like, and he's a very well-known artist there, you know. So this is the thing that in Lebanon, like, nobody went to jail, you know. And uh, I, after the war, nobody was really judged or sentenced or... So that's how it becomes like a fer very fertile ground for all kinds of racist mm -hmm. behaviors and uh, misjudgments and uh, misreadings when it comes to this. And, and Jungians, of course, believe that trauma is passed from generation to generation, especially when it's, when it's unspoken. Yeah, that's so, true. And that's why, for example, it's too much probably of a, of a reality to deal with, and fiction comes as a solution that you can just filter this reality and make it hyper a little bit or lower here, and you know, so you can just know how much you can understand it. So did you grow up in a house full of books? Oh, not at all. Actually, no, not at all. Uh, we didn't have any bookshelves, and um, I was the only guy, uh, child who was interested in uh, books. And I remember I, used, I started by reading comics like Superman, you know, like um, these, uh, comic uh, comics like superhero, let's say, 
it was a little bit, you know, like fascinating that probably, I don't know, maybe I'm just saying this now because you're asking me and I'm, I just, I'm, the answer I'm saying now is just, I just had it now. That uh, because I was bullied as a kid, you know, and it was like we lived in a very violent neighborhood and so I was constantly bullied. Probably so, like guys like Superman or Batman or like, of course I was very young, they, they really uh, represented some higher form of fictional justice, you know, for me. And I wanted this ju justice so desperately that I started to steal these magazines from the grocery store, you know. Mm -hmm. And pr probably, you know, uh, I don't know, but I did a couple of times and I was really happy to bring these superheroes. When did you home. toy? Did you have toys as a child? No, not, uh, not much actually. We played more. In, mm. Yeah. Because, well, the reason I ask that is in, in one of your stories, one of the child protagonists refers to a collection of uh, matchbox uh, cars, and yeah, that struck me as something that I would have found unexpected for a child to be able to have a massive collection of matchbox cars in, yeah, in well, the <clears> that time. I think my answers sound a little bit miserable, you know, in a way like, like, so, like, I'm so miserable, you know, so Palestinian, dramatic, and, you know, all this thing, it's terrible. And now, another question that makes me want to say that I didn't have toys, yeah. and I fancy these toys, you know, like cars, and so, yeah, like, yeah, but and of course the other reason I lived a miserable childhood. I'm just realizing that now. <laughs> and, and the other reason I ask that question is, of course, in the days before toys uh, were self-animated, um, a lot of children first developed their imagination and their ability to, to compose stories from the toys, like the Bronte sisters. All their first stories were composed about the games they played with their their brothers' toy soldiers. And, couldn't have noticing that there's so many toy soldiers on the cover of your book and with the match. So I was wondering if, if play as a child had any influence on the development of your imagination and your capacity to formulate stories. Well, definitely. Actually, uh, the thing is, like, uh, uh, after I moved to Iceland in 2011, I realized that um, the peace in Iceland was so disturbing. You know, it was so peaceful that it disturbed me. I couldn't function, I couldn't think. It was like nobody is tense, nobody is frustrated, people are too polite, you know, and I, <laughs> and I have lived. But you know, the, the fascinating thing about Icelanders is that the crime laws are very, uh, crime ra uh, rate is very, very low, but they have one of the finest crime fiction in the world, you know, so yeah. they, they live imagining crimes. <laughs> <laughs> and which is, I don't know. I don't know if it's really a better place or worse place when it comes to like living among people who imagine crimes all the time. And they're really good at it, you know. So it's like, but I did, it took me some time to, to, to realize that. And then the thing is that uh, I realized that uh, I lived all my life under tension and frustration among like, people who kept assuming things, uh, assume things uh, about me and people who you cannot disagree with. If you disagree with somebody, you offend them, you know, in a place that we are telling. So I think I started to, to go back to my memory and my childhood and try to make something out of it, and it came like out these stories. Do you find it restricting and constraining as a writer to be almost always associated with your uh, background of conflict? And, you know, is it something I think I think writing is a, is a process of uh, of uh, honesty, you know, in a way. And I think I'm really grateful to my to my paranoia because I'm like, really paranoid and it's inspiring. Me. Yeah. <laughs> it inspires me because I imagine I keep imagining things that are really terrible and and it inspires me. And this paranoia is coming from my childhood, you know. So I, I think I can't complain. Yeah, of course it was horrible, but uh, it feeds me with characters and ideas sometimes, okay. you know. And I think also, like, I try to, to be this, uh, uh, I mean, say this kitschy statement that, oh, writing is a healing process, and, you know, like, I think it makes you really... Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, more about the process in a minute. Then. But, of course, just to let people know, you ended up in Iceland because you criticized... Um, 
stress out in, in Syria. And for your life, you've had to go there. Um, but one of the interesting statistics I've learned from reading about you is that 10% of Icelandic people have published books. Yeah. So, um, tell us your experience about the first Icelandic person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know the story. I know. Yeah. yeah, and it's the cliche of me. It's my cliche, you know, my cliche now. Because I say it everywhere. It's like when I when I got this uh, email that, oh, we got your residency. You have you have got a residency in Reykjavik. I was so desperate to leave Lebanon, so I immediately replied, yes, I'm very happy to get it. And then I went and Googled Reykjavik. Where, where is this? Where is it? <laughs> really, so it's just like, wherever it is, I'm, I'm very, very, you know, I, well, I would like to go there. And, and then I thought, oh, Iceland, wow. I've never heard of any writer in Iceland, so there is no writers in Iceland, you know. Because the, the, the literature that filters through the Middle East is also literature that's controlled by the history of colonization by the British and the French and the Americans and the Russians. So it's like all these big forces that played an important role in the Middle East, between brackets, important role in dividing the Middle East and doing all these horrible things. Uh, they also control through their cultural institutions what kind of literature would filter. So we wouldn't get any access to Scandinavian literature, but first the British, the French, and the Russian, in a way. So I thought, oh, well, I work as a cultural journalist in uh, these newspapers in Lebanon and London, and I haven't heard of any Icelandic writers, so Icelandic writers don't exist. And I went to Iceland, and the person who received me was like Sean, and I didn't know that this was the person who was nominated for Oscar Best Song in, for Dancer in the Dark, the movie. And I didn't know who this person is, and I started to realize that, okay, there's a bunch of writers. And like, I think a few days later, I had a problem in the sink, in my kitchen, in Reykjavik, and somebody called a plumber, and this guy went in, and like, he was like very old man, like, probably about 70 something years old. And then he went down like and was trying to fix this pipe. He was like talking to me. So what do you do for a living? He asked me, I was like, I'm a writer. Me too. <laughs> and then he didn't give any uh, concern or anything. He didn't give a shit uh, about the thing. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna give you my book. And he opened his like tools bag and he picked up a book. A novel about plumbing. <laughs> it sounds actually like a cheap porn. <laughs> plumbing, a you novel know, about plumbing. You know? And he was like, You gotta read this book. You have to learn Icelandic and read this book. And I was like, Wow, everybody is. Like, I was like, Okay, like everybody, this guy is a writer. And then you go to the taxi, and the taxi is a writer. And everyone is a writer, even the people who don't write. You know, so there's like 10% of the Icelandic population published a book, which is like 33,000 authors. This is, I think, bigger than the number in the Middle East, the whole Middle East. I'm not sure if we have like 33,000, you know. Of course, of course, not everybody is a good writer in, in some way, but I think I like this. Uh, and it, of course, goes back to the history of Iceland and how uh, in the old times when they didn't have accessibility to hot water and electricity, and when they were challenged by these big forces of nature, wind and, you know, like, uh, and cold and darkness, they all gathered at homes and read. This was the only thing that they could do, and they developed a very strong uh, relation to their culture, literary culture and language. And this is really something I highly appreciate. So the courtesy of buying a book by... Uh each acquaintance of yours who's published a book in Iceland would be a very expensive project. Yeah, of course, you know, sometimes you have these writers who decide to be just writers, and you have to they come and say, hey, man, you want to buy it? At least I haven't eaten for two days, and this book is like 30 euros, and like, okay, you have to do this. And okay. It's time for your first time. <laughs> So um, I 
think uh, in 2015, I was uh, granted this uh, residency in the Alps, in North Italy. And uh, uh, it was a writing residency for seven weeks. And I ended up like in a village where everybody speaks German. And they, they are Italians, but they really don't like the idea that they are Italians, so they are Germans. Because in the First World War, this part was, this sector was part of Austria, and they are still like really unhappy about the fact that they are Italians. So I ended up like, where am I? You know, I was supposed to be in the Alps, and then nobody is being known. There is no pizza, nothing. <laughs> so I ended up like riding. I, for some reason, I didn't like the landlady. I was mistaken because she was very sweet, but as you know, like she was like, so I immediately wrote a short story inspired by her and the poor dog that she had. It's called The Matchstick Dog. The dog guarding the house I'm temporarily residing at in the Alps is almost blind. There is tumor in his left eye and it's in the color of the island. The tumor hangs out remarkably, as if it was a giant teardrop, and you can see in it some things that pulsate. It affects both of his eyes, and to remove it by surgery will be of no use. The dog is on his way to lose his eyesight completely. It's a matter of days. Besides, he's old. He can barely get up when you come close to him, but he makes an effort. He makes a great effort indeed every time. He does not succeed in getting up until after you have cursed him in pity and walked away and are now about to enter the main door of the house. Then you glance at him just as you are about to close the door and he gives you a look that says, don't leave me here or take me into the house with you or even hide me in your room. It's a look that has more than one meaning. You can't tell exactly what it means. Like, it is with the look of all dogs. I mean those dogs that can see properly, that jump and bark and play with children. However, here there are no children. I'm the youngest tenant, even younger than the dog himself. So he treats me like a child. He wags his exhausted tail, pretending that he's happy with everything I offer him even if it was a boy apple. Eddie, a woman in her 70s, is the land lady. She notices my interest in the dog. Well, my fake interest. Because I actually make an effort. I make a great effort indeed every time. I stand for a while by the dog wherever, whenever I'm back at the house. But I try not to look at the tune. I shut my eyes and I even wish I had bad eyesight, of course, without a tumor the size of a giant teardrop. I touch the fur of the dog and smile nervously, out of caution. Perhaps someone is watching me from somewhere. Edit, for instance. So I have to act gently. The tumor, in fact, makes me nervous. It even makes me sick, I have to say. After I enter my room, I immediately go to the bathroom to wash my hands with an olive soap, olive oil soap that I have brought with me all the way from Tunisia. Once, as I was washing my hands, I had a panic attack. And it notices that I start to steal apples from the fields surrounding the house. Every day I enter the field and steal an apple. Just one apple a day. But it takes me a long time, despite the fact that there are many apples around. It's because the stolen apple has to be perfectly round and smooth, like a bowl of dough. I have thought it through very carefully. It suits me better to play with the dog from a distance rather than to oblige myself to touch him. At that point, I'm still not aware of the fact that the dog is almost blind. Every time I come home, I roll an apple directly towards the dog although I know that he cannot get up. On the first day, he receives the apple with joy, but he's unable to bite his teeth into it. So every day I boil the stolen apple before I roll it to him. I do that for three days, but on the fourth day, I see Edith, 
who asks me if I have paid attention to the dog. I reply jokingly, of course I have. Do you think I'm blind? She says, I mean, have you noticed that the dog is blind? <laughs> I'm perplexed, I'm embarrassed, and I try to smile politely. She tells me that it's no joke, that it's a matter of days before the dog loses his eyesight completely, and that the apples must have accelerated his blindness because they contain sugar. They say, then she says to me, you're exaggerating your interest in the dog. There is no need for that. We had a brief talk that day. Edith is Austrian. This is how she considers herself, despite the fact that she carries only an Italian citizenship. <laughs> During the First World War, the Italians took over this part. She says, you are from the Middle East and must have witnessed atrocities so seeing a dog pass away is something silly that wouldn't matter to you. I don't tell Edith that when I was a child I had a dog. He was polite. Mom and dad had brought him, bought him when he was still a puppy as a gift for their first wedding anniversary. I used to put my skinny arm up to the elbow down his mouth and drop match sticks into his stomach and he wouldn't make a move. I was just a child. During the war, matchsticks were more abundant than any kind of food. As the quarries of mom and dad went on, the dog's body began to dry out. He too had that look of more than one meaning. He fixed it on me while I stuffed his stomach with more matchsticks. I kept doing that until he lost all his fur and his entire skin and all that was left of him was a matchstick dog. I could no longer move him from his place because I was afraid he would fall apart. I stayed close to him until the first car bomb exploded. When that happened, he fell apart because of the vibrations. I collected him in a plastic jar and carried him and threw him into the sea because a matchstick dog cannot drown. Later, we knew that the jar had exploded after bumping into a mine in the water. The lit matchsticks were blown over the water all at the same time, and while burning, each one of the matchsticks produced a little sound similar to a bark. Now, Edith asks me to do her a favor. She wants me to help her kill the dog. However, we would wait a few more days until he becomes totally blind, she says. I wouldn't have asked you if my son was here, but he went to me to watch a football match. He won't return before two weeks from now. That would be too long. The climate conditions these days are suitable to kill the dog, and the air temperature is ideal for air drying his body. Edith doesn't want to just kill the dog, but to embalm his body. She tells me in a strict voice that I shall pierce the apple several times with a needle and then boil them in water saturated with sugar because this will make the apple sweeter and will accelerate the dog's blindness. Days later, while I'm rolling an apple, boiled and sweet as jam to the dog, Edith's voice strikes me. She's standing in the window. She says, no need for this apple. It's happened. This morning he had become completely blind. We would better carry out the killing after lunch. I feel Edith is lying because as I get closer to the dog, he gives me the same look that says, don't leave me here or take me to the house with you or even hide me in your room. It makes me feel bad. I really don't want to kill the dog, but eventually I obey the woman. I say to myself, it's bad to leave him alive in such state. And after lunch, the three of us are in an apple field nearby Edith's house. It's a field that she inherited from her beloved grandfather when she was still a child. She gives me a pistol, a First World War leftover piece. You have to shoot here, so the pellet goes directly into his heart and melts it. We have only this pellet, and we must remove it from the dog's chest after killing him and put it back in the gun. 
It's a rare piece and it must be returned to the cabinet in the living room where it's always been, she says. I'm all ears to what Edith says, but as I'm about to perform her instructions at the right moment, I find myself suddenly lifting the blind dog up in the air with my both hands and shaking him strongly and nervously, hoping he will fall apart into matchsticks. After that, I do not remember anything. Edith later tells me that after I had raised the dog and shaken him, I had some kind of nervous breakdown that made me lose my eyesight for some time. Despite that, in a way that seemed weird to her, I insisted on killing the dog. So Edith had handed me back the pistol with her and with her own eyes, she says, she saw how I fired the sole pellet at him and that I was very precise despite the blindness that had struck me. I was smooth and confident as a serial killer of pet dogs. This is what Edith says. As for me, and I know it's ridiculous, and it's not the case, I can't help but thinking that the blindness that struck me came at the right time so that I wouldn't have to look at the tumor while killing the dog. Thank you. Reading different reviews of jokes for the Golden Man, it struck me that I couldn't help noticing each reviewer brought the their own individual restricted worldview to your book. So one reviewer said, your literary precursor was Julio Cortazar. And another reviewer said, your main literary precursor was Edgar Carreff. And another reviewer said, your main literary precursor was were Samuel Beckett and, and Franz Kafka. But you told me the other day, actually, that you learned a lot from Frank O'Connor. Do you tell us a little bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, I actually came across his uh, his uh, stories by, by, by I came across uh, the stories of Frank O'Connor through a small uh, collection, maybe of short, four short stories, published by Penguin, and it was called uh, "The Trumpet Player Who Betrayed His Nation" or something like that. And of course, you know, as Palestinians, we have really uh, big empathy with Ireland. You know, we feel like that that uh, we have common uh, we have common like understanding to what colonialism means, and you know, this history. And uh, and we know that Britain played a big, big, important role by like just uh, uh, making all these Palestinians leave their country and whatever. So when I came across this like Irish writer who was also I've never heard of. Like, I think I was in Paris and I found it in uh, Shakespeare and Co. And I read these stories and I was stuck, struck like by this like vividness. And he's political, but very human, very humane, and very like, um, uh, yeah, very like, um, Literally as well, like so. It's like this mixture of like not being too political, not being too unpolitical, you know, but being able to frame everything in one story that's like telling the history also of the Irish, like you know, uh, resistance or struggle or political like uh, 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 conflict inside Ireland. Uh, it was it was great, you know. And then I kept uh, for some time I was looking for his books, you know, like, uh, so I would travel in Europe and then go to the bookstores, see if I can find something else by Frank O'Connor. And now I have like this book that's really weird. It's like poetry, essays, short stories by him, you know, like everything in one book. Okay, so, and I'll give you another one to take away with you tonight, but again, one of the things he has in common with you is uh, depicting how People who are suffering uh, rely on humor as a survival uh, tactic. You know? and, and again, when you're talking about uh, how in Palestine you felt a certain, um, certain sympathetical with the Irish situation, uh, down here in the south, we had the privilege of having the, the stability and peace of Iceland, I guess. 
while at a very close distance being able to observe a vicious, vicious uh, sectarian conflict. And, you know, you know the, the, the place of jokes uh, in, in that sort of conflict is, is integral to this book. Then. But the other thing is, like, well, while your stories are humorous, um, like, like all the best humorous stories, they don't play for laughs. The humor comes organically, I think, out of, out of the absurdism. But the, 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 there's, there's a, you know, there are jokes that are universal. And there's an Irish joke I want to tell you now to ask, is there, does the, does the same joke exist in a slightly different form in the Lebanon of Palestine? And the Irish joke actually comes in two forms. And the first form is this masked gunman on the Belfast street holds up another man with a gun. And he says, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? And the man answers, I'm a Jew. Mm-hmm. And the gunman says, well, are you a Catholic Jew or are you a Protestant Jew? <laughs> and the second version of the joke goes, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? And the man says, I'm a Jew. And the gunman says, well, I must be the luckiest Arab in Belfast. <laughs> are, you know, are there jokes like that? Is this a joke? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, you know, with yeah. what, what you can find funny it varies from country to country and from yeah. period in history to period in history. But actually, of course, you know, in Lebanon, there are, there are jokes that led people to jail. You know, yeah. that's really made some people disappear because of a joke. Uh, I remember actually when I was a kid uh, in school, uh, we heard this story like about another kid who, uh, like apparently his father didn't like one of the leaders of one of the militias leaders, and the kid told his friend that my father doesn't like this guy. They were walking down the street and they saw a picture, and the father of this kid disappeared. You know, so eventually this kid told his father and who told the militia man and took the guy. And this, this is one of the really stories that I heard at very, very early age, and I was scared, like, you know, that um, you have to be very careful what to say and what not to say and, you know, what to express in a way. So you're like, um, yeah, we have all kinds of jokes. You know? And then I think when you're under a state of, of war, uh, of course, the, the, the twisted statement is like, yeah, war comes because of patriarchy, but I think war enforces patriarchy afterwards, and it, it uh, roots, it deepens the patriarchal system and the society, because it's all about, you know, men and men taking decisions and etc. So, um, yeah, I have to be very careful. When I wrote this book, I really didn't intend to be to do any humor or anything like that, but I was just following, you know, the, it was very fluid, this yeah. writing, and uh, yeah. I was really living in a miserable state in, in, in Iceland because I didn't want to work and I was very financially very, very low. And I was seeing this, constantly seeing this movie by Aki Karismaki, like The Bohemian or it's one of the most depressing movies, you know, and I kept seeing it all the time and like feeling my depression, feeling I'm self like, and then writing these stories. I don't know really how writing. Again, as a as a, as a, as a, as a trying to make, the best humor comes from writing which doesn't actually play for laughs, which comes organically. And you were saying how the, the, your paranoia fed these stories and your stories in these stories. I actually want to say something because, like, when st- people started asking me about like where this humor comes from in these stories that happened in Beirut in the 80s, or you know, I went back in memory and I remember like a couple of times we were in the shelters, we were kids. And the bumping is there, and death is every like you can hear the sound of death, you know, and you can sense that you might die any moment, at any moment, at any second. But people were making fun of each other sometimes, you know. It was like as if, for example, the wish of this man is like to make fun of the other before he dies, you know, like just like, okay, we're gonna die, I'm gonna say something mean and funny about it, <laughs> and then we die, you know, like that. So it was, but I think it was also a way to to deny reality because humor at that moment 
comes out as, as a supreme <coughs> moment of liberty, you know, because as you decide to tell a joke, you are breaking through the uh, the power of of the war, you know, because the war, like uh, trauma, is very uh, very controlling, you know, uh, uh, manipulating uh, emotion in a way that you it manipulates you in, into one state in a way of thinking and you know narrows you and then you come out with these or come up with these jokes or try to make jokes and it's like you're very free at that moment. So I think probably people wanted to experience like this freedom that they were longing for, you know, through these jokes that would last for thirty seconds or twenty seconds, you know. And of course laughter is a great emotional reliever and release or the many stories and the Soldiers from the Second World War telling about, you know, running through a street being chased by machine gun bullets, losing some of their, uh, uh, you know, some, some of them actually dying during the process, and the ones who live getting beyond the bullets and laughing, uh, you know, after the experience. Yeah, humans are weird. <laughs> when, when we have your second story now? Uh, the second story, I think it's, uh, uh, it's about a bicycle. And I'm sorry, maybe the story sounds that depressing, but I was actually listening to some music. I decided to read these stories just like an hour ago. You know? So I was supposed to read from jokes for the gunman, and then I decided, no, I'm going to read these stories. So it's called The Lion Cub. And of course, in Lebanon, we lived also in, I lived in a street where kids were also armed, and sometimes they had pistols, and they would really... Uh, uh, let's say, uh, traumatize other kids and, uh, and bully them. You know, and I was one of the kids who was never allowed to carry a gun. My mom was very strict. We always had to go to school. We shouldn't carry guns or hang out with the guys, the kids who carry guns. Are you talking about real guns or toys? Real guns, yeah. It was actually uh, like uh, metallic guns, but they would go to this, some iron smith, and he would make the holes bigger, so they were very good for six millimeter bullets, you know, so it was quite scary because the kids are carrying these guns, they buy them from the grocery store and then they change them into like real machines and you don't know which gun is six millimeter or which gun is still a toy, you know, so it was like quite really scary. And so this is a bit longer short story. The lion cub. We had no idea the lion cub was not in fact a lion cub until his bicycle was stolen. He didn't have the guts to try anything to get it back. He just shot a few rounds in the air from the be his bedroom window, then lay down on this, his sponge mattress on the ground, staring at the ceiling, tears dripping from his wide open eyes, longing intensely for his mother his gun at his side. The bicycle had actually been a gift from his mother, though we had only seen him riding it a handful of times. He had it on display in a glass case on our street, right near the school so that everyone could see it. No one had the nerve to even think about stopping to take a good look at it, though. The lion cub would have gone crazy. He would have come to you at night and shot you while you slept in your bed. For the lion cub, shooting someone was as easy as trimming your nails because his gun was fitted with a silencer. After he shot someone, he would get rid of the gun and replace it with another of a different make and model, gifted 16 year old serial killer that he was. So there was no one ready to forfeit their life just to get a look at the bicycle. There were some in the neighborhood who would even cast a weak smile in its direction or salute it with a quick nod, like it was some fearsome dog guarding the street. But not me. Me, whenever I passed by the bicycle, I was overcome by the desire to pounce on it and tear a chunk 
of it out with my teeth. It was a thing so stunning, it made me know, ravenous. A chopper, orange and white, with two brown wheels that green summer and winter, like they had been molded out of yogurt, swirled through with cherries and chocolate. The front wheel was small, but the rear wheel was way bigger. I even let myself imagine how you had to be careful not to pedal it too fast, because then it might melt. It was so immen immaculately clean. Clean like laundry detergent crystals. The mere sight of it was enough to throw me into a state of turmoil. But really, it was the opposite of everything I've said. It was a bicycle of utmost might. Form of nickel and lead, like when the first car bomb exploded at the roundabout closest to our neighborhood, and we all stood there, slack jaws with horror, watching the rising column of smoke, the lion cup crowd that his bicycle could climb right up the side of that column, no problem. As if the car bomb, along with the victims it struck down, were all just part of some advertisement for the awesomeness of his bicycle. The glass case where the Lion Cup had the chopper on display had originally been set up to house a statue of Saint Matanius, patron saint of lunatics. But on the very day his mother was admitted on, on but on the very day his mother was admitted to the mental hospital, the Lion Cup removed the saint and replaced it with his bicycle. That was back before the first skirmish, skirmishness that marked the beginning of the war. Ours, our neighborhood was not a Christian neighborhood. The case and its resident saint had been a gift from the people who lived one neighborhood over, those whom the war would soon force us to cut ties with entirely. Their kids now armed to the teeth had slunk into our area at night to steal the chopper from its glass case, in retaliation for defiling the owner of the missing patron saint. After the Lion Cup had moved the wax figure of Saint Matanus from the display case, he had commanded me, with just a nod from his head, to sew its body down the middle lengthwise, and then I would secured a belt of fat fireworks around one of its house and launched it at the Christian neighborhood. I did this in full view of everyone. A few hours later, the people on our side began erecting barricades. I knew very well that the saint and its case had only been placed in our neighborhood on my account. They had appeared right on my birthday an offering from the Christians to express their pity for my plight. This I knew from the barber's eyes, which spoke to me every time I went to him for a haircut. They also told me that I needed to hurry up and get better as fast as possible before the outbreak of the first patents. If I got better, our people would return the saint and the case safely to the Christians, maybe even with a thank you note and they would have a barbecue and slaughter a lamb in celebration. We would manage to keep our neighborhood entirely safe from the war and avoid many battles, and confine ourselves to the few small fortifications we would build on the rooftops of some of the houses in the neighborhood. Someone had put forward the idea that we could turn these fortifications into a kind of memorial. We would give the children some black asphalt and have them scrawled on the walls accounts of good times they had shared with the Christian children, of parties and celebrations they had attended together and stuff, along with the dates of each occasion, if they could remember them. But if I failed to comply with the saints' will, if I didn't get better and the war didn't break out, the statue would be destroyed immediately because it was a Christian statue, and hence its presence would be seen as a provocation to our people, and then its destruction.
construction would be a perfect pretext to invade our neighborhood. So everything depended on me. And clearly, I was under a lot of pressure. I needed to be cured of what ailed me and fast. Everyone else knew, knew it too, their eyes boring into me, following me home every day on my way back from my plumber's job. The grocer, the mechanic, the guy who ran the sporting goods store, the guy at the roastery. Children too. Once one of them shouted after me while I was walking into my building. Hey, why are not you getting any better? And when I entered the apartment, my mother and my grandfather and sister's eyes all came as well. We have nowhere to run to. You have to get better. You have no choice. My mother lit incense sticks every day, painting my head, pressing on that spot between my eyes while murmuring verses from the Quran, always concluding with, get well, as I fell asleep. And when I watched the scout troop, now in military uniforms, going through their training drills in the empty lot, they would stop suddenly and all at once, their eyes turning my way, and I could understand exactly what they were saying. We have to train hard because we know you will never be cured. Then they would go back to their trails. In short, as the days marched on and the streets and houses slid ever onward toward the gnashing jaws of war, the statue became my own particular cross to bear. And so I felt intense pleasure as I tied it to the firework and fired it into the air, almost as if I were the one flying. The lion cub, however, remained exceedingly pragmatic. Out of everywhere else, he was the only one who understood that I would never be cured. I know you will never be cured, he would say, whenever we met at the arcade. That's why I carry this gun around. Look, this tube here makes it so the gun won't make any sound. Like if I were to shoot you, no one would know you have died. Not even you. I love that part of the story about how I would die without anyone knowing that I was dead. And so every time I saw the line cut, I would ask him to tell me again, tell me that story again, I would say, about how if I died, no one would know. And he would pull the gun out lightly from his behind his back while the other kids freaked out, cock it, and say, this is the gun, and this tube here is so that it doesn't make any sound. Like if I were to take you out right now to that alley and shoot you, none of these people here would know you're dead, not even you. And pleasure would tingle throughout my body, all the way to the island of scar on my pinky toe. My skull prickling the way it did when I peed. And I would say, take me up to the alley and shoot me, like I was daring him to do, to do it. Except, he would reply, you would have to be cured first. I wouldn't shoot someone who wasn't all there in his head. <laughs> then, bark, then bark at me to get out of his face. It was clear that the lion cub wouldn't shoot me no matter how much I begged. It was a matter of pride for him. He even bragged about it in a letter to his girl, a ninth grader who lived on the ground floor of his apartment building. She told me about it herself when I went over to unclog the kitchen drain in her house, sidling right up behind me as I fiddled with the copper flex and whispered, Did you know? You're the reason why I love you. Ever since the lion cub wrote and told me he would never shoot you, I started falling for him. When he told me he would never shoot you, I realized what a sensitive soul he is. <laughs> His hair was slender. Her behind was like a watermelon half, and her breast the size of toilet floats, and her eyes were droopy with sleep day and night. And when she talked, it was like someone had just encased her head in a plastic bag. When she said what she said, she spoke so softly that after she slipped away, I wept, my tears flowing down into her kitchen drain. 
Such a state was the knowledge that it was more likely that the people of our neighborhood would turn into soap than get the line cop to agree to shoot me. There was all, also no way to get into his house on the fourth floor. It was rumored that he would booby trap the front door, that if you touch it wrong, it would explode. Otherwise, it would have been easy to break into his bathroom and remove his two golden fish, goldfish from the tub, and then wait naked until the shower until he under the shower until he came home and shoot you. After the line cop's mother was admitted to the mental hospital, the people in our neighborhood took to spitting on me as I passed instead of just contenting themselves with staring. The barber told me this was all my fault because I refused to get better. Worse, that because I was dragging my feet so much on the whole getting better thing, Saint Antonius had lost his patience and now bore us only in will. Why else would it have been the Lion Cosmos out of all the women in the neighborhood who went crazy? Soon, my mother also became a nervous wreck, crying at the drop of a hat, and my grandfather coughed harder than ever, speaking up way more plain than necessary. I knew they blamed me because they couldn't figure out any other reason for the war to break out. It wasn't the sort of life that could make me happy. But then, when the lion cop put his bike in his play case, an idea flashed into my head, bright as lightning. I reckoned that the only way to get him to shoot me was to break into the case and park myself on the shopper in broad daylight. I would leave the house exactly as if I were heading to work at 8.30 in the morning, but instead of going to the plumbers, I would merely cross the street and in just a few steps find myself not only inside the glass case but fully seated on the chopper. And then I would only have to sit there until the lion cops spotted me and shot me. Maybe he would even shoot me from his bedroom window while he was still in his underpants and undershirt. Anyway, the main thing was that when I died, I would know it. And so no harm would really come to me at all. I would no longer feel any of the neighbors' snacks on my neck and no longer be moved by my mother's tears or be affected by all the words that scroll across everyone's eyes. About how my faith and the statues were intertwined. But above all, I would also be the only person in the entire neighborhood who would ever ridden the chopper. That morning, I kissed my sleeping mother and washed out the pot that held my, all my grandfather's plan and put it back in its usual place right by his head. But when I left the house, I could hardly believe my eyes. The bike was not there. I was so shocked and upset. It was as if it were my own bike that had gone missing. My eyes filled with tears. My chin trembled. I stepped into the case, my mind blank, looking all around, feeling the air, the glass walls, as if maybe the chopper was actually in there, but I just couldn't see it. A group of neighbors gathered around me, watching. No one actually dared to set foot inside the case to pull me out. Even when they saw the lion cop approaching, no one said he's coming to get out of there quickly or anything like that. The lion cop came up behind me and jerked me back roughly so that I fell out of the case and onto the ground. He was furious, you could tell from his red ears, and his gun was clutched in his hand. I had no idea the bike was, had actually been stolen. I thought he would put it in another case or take it home, which is why I begged, please put the chopper back in the case. That's when the line cop went back to his room and shot a few rounds into the air and remembered his mother and cried. I have to mention here that the case and the patron saint hadn't been gifted to us for no reason, but because the Christians were sad and ashamed that it was their kids who had messed me up in the first place. Specifically, the son of the head of the charity organization that put on benefits for kids with kidney disease. We were at the arcade, which was tucked anyway away in a neutral corner between our two neighborhoods.
boots and I was wearing boxing gloves. They were not professional boxing gloves, not even amateur boxing gloves, but I was really pleased with them nonetheless. They were a prize from a Rico biscuit company that I got in exchange for 50 empty wrappers. <laughs> they had that ridiculous drawing on them of a biscuit with two small arms wearing boxing gloves. <laughs> bumbling away at the air. And I didn't mind. They were the first boxing gloves I, I would ever wore. <coughs> I had ever worn. Back then, more than anything else, I wanted to be a boxing champion, saving the world with his punches, without really having any idea what one had to punch in this whole world, in this whole wide world, order to save it. A powerful, fearsome boxer, like one who fought with elephant tongues wrapped around his fists instead of gloves. Then the head of the charity organization's kid turned up and asked me to borrow my gloves. Said he wanted to try them out on the punching bag in the arcade. Somehow they were in his possession less than a minute later. And as soon as he slipped his fingers inside and curled, his large hands into fists, the gloves stripped open, and he refused to give me 50 Rico biscuits packets <laughs> in exchange for ruining my gloves. When I came home, they stroke, unable to understand why any of this had happened. My mother stitched up with the tears with needle and thread. But that wasn't the reason why I began having these seizures that left me unable to trust anything I heard or saw. That came later, when I went to the house of the charity head son the next day, wearing the patched up Rico gloves, waiting for him to open the door so I could sock him in the face and run for it. Because when he did open the door, I saw that all ten of his fingers had been mutilated. He'd been trying to straighten his little sister's hair with a hot iron and suffered an electrical burn. All the fingers had melted together so that they curled up into a fist, almost as if they were still thrust into the mangled Rico gloves. He cast his miserable eyes down on my gloves, like he blamed them, and his mother and father stared too. And I felt something tear through my brain, something I had never felt before. From that day on, I had seizures. My head would go rigid and freeze up, and my eyes and my lips, my ears, my eyebrows, and my dimples too. I would be unable to see or hear or smell anything around me. At school, I stopped believing the lessons the teachers gave us, and I stopped going to class. And even though the kid ended up having surgery on his fingers so that his hands were almost the same as they had been before, the Caesars never stopped and I left school and began working as a plumber. Later, they started calling me the pattern saint of blood drains because I was so adept at inserting the spiral flex into the blood drain and pulling the obstruction out in one go. That's the gift I had been granted by the Caesars, an uncanny sense for blocked drains. <laughs> but even so, the soft-hearted Christian neighbors continued to act guilty around me. Some of them would go so far as to block their own sinks and drains with wads of toilet paper or plastic bags or socks so that I would come and unblock them, ensuring that I had work. On my first birthday after that, they bequeathed our neighborhood with St. Antonius and his case. Should the war break out, I would be the only one who would be able to move freely between our neighborhoods, between our neighborhood and the Christian one, since the militia men there were none than the son of the head of the charity organization and his friends, and none of them could really be bothered to kill me. That's because in wartime, you only kill people in order to provoke the other side. My death, however, would have provoked no one. It didn't even matter that I had tied St. Matanus up to a fat firework and shot it toward the neighborhood. And so, when the lion cub wanted to get his chopper back, 
he came to me. When my mother saw him, her knees went weak and she couldn't get up anymore. My grandfather fell into a coughing fit, but I was proud, so proud that I left the door wide open and the three windows too so that everyone could see that the line cup was over at our house. I even taunted him, interrupting him while he was talking to go clean my grandfather's spit, spit to me. Of course, I said yes right away. On one condition, I whispered in him, I whispered it in his ear, one con on the condition that you shoot me with a silencer while I'm riding your chopper. The lion cub, though, thought long and hard, looking into my eyes, and then said that this would bring shame to him, but he would do it for the chopper's sake, not for mine. And he would do it for somewhere, he would do it somewhere no one could see us at the kindergarten playground at the nearby school. I needed to be showered, though, washed clean of any plumber's stink, and I needed to be wearing a large smoke because he didn't want any blood spattering on his chopper. Immediately, I thought of the barber's smoke, and the lion cop said he would get it himself, and I agreed. The Christian kids refused to hand over the chopper on the first day. They said I had to go get the statue first, since anyway, I would never be cured. When I went back to them on the evening of the second of the next day, the statue was in a bag hanging off my shoulder. It was broken in two, maybe even three pieces, and some of its wax limbs had melted because of the exploding firework. But the chopper was there, waiting for me. So clean, it looked like it had just come out of the glass case, sparkly, not a single scratch on it. It was the first time I would be so much as lying a finger on the chopper. I was beside myself with emotion, so excited, I got a hard on. This made the children laugh, and they ordered me kindly to leave, saying, even if you yourself were to turn into sand, Matanis, you will never be cured. I made my way to the kindergarten playground at the school. The lion cub was already there waiting for me, holding a gun fitted with a silencer. A gun I would never I had never seen before. It was silver and lighter than any of the others. I've never used this gun before, he told me, handing me the smoke, his eyes fixed on the chopper. But from now on I won't use any of them. I promised my mother that. I visited her at the hospital today. She's getting out soon. We're going to go to the mountains, she and I, the way we used to do before. And she will never, she will watch me riding around on the chopper. The doctor said it would help her get better. I didn't feel like any of this had much to do with me. I was holding the bike wondering only whether it would, be, it would be better to sit on the chopper of my own accord or wait for the lion cub to give me his permission first. But the lion cub interrupted my train of thought, taking the bike from me and handing me the smoke, which I put on immediately so he would understand that I was ready to ride. He pulled out a small flashlight, examining every inch of the bike, and not only and only when he was done did he say, all right, you can write it now, but carefully. And I, and I who, had, who had never ridden a bike before, kept my feet on the ground, holding on with all my might so that the bike wouldn't topple over. The chopper for the first time seemed small to me. I was just about to say this to the lion cub, that the chopper seemed a lot smaller than it had appeared in the case, except he leveled his gun and aimed the silencer at my chest and fired. My bones jangled with pain immediately like a whole army of cockroaches had risen up from the sewers to gnaw at my body, and I was made of yogurt swirled through, through with cherries and chocolate. I fell to the ground because that's just what you do at moments like this. The bike remained upright, still held in the lion's cup, lion cup's hand. He didn't even glance my way. He turned the chopper around and mounted it, pedaling slowly across the playground away from me. As I watched him, casting one last look at the bike, 
which had always so mesmerized me, I noticed a small object lying next to me, a small hot object letting off light wisps of smoke, a bullet, a rubber bullet, a bullet from the Lion Cubs new gun, which hadn't penetrated me at all, for there was not a single trace of blood on the barber's smoke. The Lion Cub had not only tricked me, he was mocking me. I wanted to get up and run after him, but the pain in my bones was just too much. And just as I was about to scream out to get his attention, the chopper's handled bars exploded, blowing the bike to smitherness and leaving no trace of the Lion Cub. Thank you. Thank you.